introduce myself as Orca Annie in that clean kit language. Um, and you will hear us use the word kit throughout this presentation. It's a clean kit word for killer whale. We'll probably throw in some other coastal words for killer whale. Knatan you hut was sock, chalk na hutsati, ushkatan I hut. I wear a shark as my crest, but I'm here to speak for the killer whales. Keat. We do uh, an event pretty much every summer up in the San Juan Islands called Orca Sing, and I created, actually, we created this song to hopefully call in, to pay respect to, to all the pods, J, K, and L pods. So, Part of the song is uh, a welcoming, a yela is uh, a greeting, hello and goodbye, and it's also a song of respect for the whales. And again, you'll hear, as she mentioned, uh, the word keet, also kwani, people of, so a yela. Yela, yela, yela. proceed I would like to say I, I, I had Heishka to, to the Duwamish for the privilege of speaking in their ancestral territory so any of the other words for thank you that he shared I didn't know we were going to do longer introductions so I probably should have added that uh, Chata Latinx and black Ayahat through my mother's side of the family and um, Irish Yeti through my father's that's how we say in um, And I didn't acknowledge my father's side, which is Norwegian. I think it from Alaska, you know. So I'm not an elder yet, so I have to cheat and refer to notes. Um, but I wanted to start out with a, uh, with a profound quote from a Mochat Mochalat elder, the Mochat Mochalat people live in uh, Nootka Sound on the west side of Vancouver Island. And one of their elders said this um, when Sukit, or as uh, probably as um, non native people know, the little whale Luna or L98, was in Nootka Sound all by himself for several years. Um, but the elder said, the Chakawan, or the killer whale, Chakawan is the New Channel word for killer whale, the Chakawan is the most sacred creature in the sea. And uh, yeah, <laughs> we think that that really fits. Um, for coastal indigenous peoples, uh, coastal indigenous peoples have shared the Northwest Coast with killer whales for at least 10,000 years. And we regard them as our honored relatives. Um, tonight, we're going to pay tribute to the sacred keat of the critically endangered southern resident community, or JKNL pods, as Odin mentioned in his song. And we will also acknowledge the transient um, mammal hunting community 
of killer whales that you might think, well, there's killer whales in here a lot. Well, those are the transient mammal hunters one, uh, mammal hunting ones. Sadly, the fish eating, the salmon eating, endangered resident killer whales do not come into these waters as often as they used to, which makes us very sad. So we regard these whales as our relatives. Um, so watching all of the deaths in the southern resident community really hurts our hearts because we are watching our family members die and some of them are dying horrible, painful deaths. But I want people to be aware of what's going on. Um, it's an, a time-honored tradition in indigenous communities to talk about your loved ones. If we had more time, we would do a memorial potlatch, so I'm doing like a really, really condensed memorial for, for some, of the, some of the remarkable whales that, that we've lost. Um, the last 250 to 300 years or so have proven to be really toxic and lethal to the southern resident um, orca community from the outright killing of whales. Uh, immigrants from Europe did not love and cherish killer whales when they first arrived here and were afraid of them and were threatened by them. So a lot of whales were just killed outright. Um, all of the habitat was, was degraded with, through excessive logging and waters got all polluted and too warm. And then um, the southern residents preferred prey is Chinook salmon and um, as you know, most of the Chinook runs in the ancestral territory of the Southern Residents, which is all up and down the West Coast, from Southeast Alaska all the way to Central California, most of those salmon runs are threatened or endangered, with the exception of the ones in Alaska. So their food has been depleted, the water's been polluted, and, and in modern times, um, modern humanity has polluted the water with noise <laughs> in the form of, you know, relentless uh, shipping traffic, uh, Navy sonar that should never be blasted through habitat that critically endangered animals use, but we don't always get agreement from the Navy on that. Um, and then just the increased vessel presence of the increased boat traffic. Uh, the, you know, these whales are popular. The whale watch boats like to go out and look at them. A lot of recreational boaters like to go look at them. So their home has gotten very, very noisy in the last hundred years or so. And then we cannot forget the capture era when an entire breeding generation of this community of whales, the southern residents, was removed. Uh, between the northern resident and southern resident communities, um, nearly 60 whales were captured. Um, all of them are dead now except for one northern resident um, who is still in captivity at SeaWorld, and her name is Corky. Um, she's from A5 Pod, and one southern resident female um, who is in captivity at the Miami Sea Aquarium. I would like to use her proper Lummy name, and I apologize to any <laughs> any Salish speakers that for, if I mispronounce it, I, I believe it's Scalicha Tenault. Um, but her stage name is Lolita, which is kind of a gross name. But anyway, those are the only two survivors from, from the capture era. And um, that really dealt an incredible blow with long-lasting consequences to this population. They have never recovered from that. And now in modern times, you have all these issues piling up one on top of the other with inability to find sufficient prey. Um, unfortunately, the survival rate of the youngsters in this community is not very great. The, the females are having a tough time bringing pregnancies to term. There's about a 70% failure rate among pregnancies in, in the southern resident community. So they are struggling to survive numerous threats and they're on the brink of extinction, um, especially one pod in particular, K-Pod, who we will talk about tonight. Those are among some of the remarkable whales. I thought this would be a good time to, to talk about one of our drums, the one that Odin is holding facing you. Uh, 
This is a design we came up with because we noticed in traditional coastal art that a lot of the killer whales seem to be males with really big dorsal fins. And guess what? Killer whale societies, particularly resident ones, are matriarchal, like a lot of coastal First Nations are matriarchal, like, like Odin, through the clinket you are, who you are, um, through your mother's side. Choctaw society is also ma matriarchal. So we did, we did this to honor the three oldest matriarchs um, in JK and L pods. We, and this design is about, is over 10 years old. Um, but the Salish designed whale down here was in honor of Lummi, or K7, who was the oldest when she was alive. And sadly, we lost her in 2008. And we also have commemorated Granny J2, who lived to be about 100 years old, and she passed in 2016. The one who is still alive is L25, or Ocean Sun. She was born roughly 1928, so she's still out there. But her family group, the L11s and what's left of the L12s are the least likely to come into the Salish Sea. Um, it's been that way for a while and they're even less likely now because there's not as many salmon in here for them to eat as there used to be. Uh, just as in indigenous societies, when we lose an elder in the southern resident community, um, when you lose elders and culture bearers, an encyclopedia of knowledge goes with those individuals and you can see noticeable changes in the behavior of the pods. Uh, J-Pod has been very different since Granny passed in 2016. They experienced an, uh, a bunch of deaths in 2016, but Granny, who was kind of the supreme matriarch and, and the leader of their group, um, that her absence is profound. I mean, I still look at them and she's like a ghost in the water for me. It's, it's like, you know, their, their ancestral spirits are with them, but of course the, 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 the whales are no longer physically present. But um, especially since Granny died, J-Pod used to be the most resident pod of the three that spent the most time in, in the inland waters here of the Salish Sea and Puget Sound. And that's just not the case anymore. Um, what's also shocking is y you might have heard that, you know, the San Juan Islands, especially the west side of San Juan Island, Harrow Strait in the summertime, used to be an extremely reliable place to see resident killer whales. And that has not been the case, that this is a compounding problem over several years now, um, where the whales, they used to spend months, uh, that was their core summer habitat and they've hardly spent any time. They come in for sporadic visits, and then they, they head out the straits again, and that, that has everything to do with the salmon returning to the Fraser River. The Fraser River is in deep trouble. There's problems on it. The salmon are not returning, so the whales aren't bothering to come in through the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Their new favorite place to hang out in the summer is like the southwest, off the southwest coast of Vancouver Island, a place called Swiftsure Bank. There's some of the research encounters have been there. But it's very sad to be up in the San Juans in June, July, and August and not see resident killer whales. Um, the story is different for the transient mammal hunting community. There are several hundred of um, transient killer whales that come into these waters now. And that's kind of, that's a change that's happened in like the last 20 years, it used to be you rarely saw um, the transient ecotype in the inland waters. Um, and now it's kind of like the roles are reversed. We have transients here a lot. You might think, well, I just saw some footage on the news. There, there were some killer whales in Elliott Bay a couple weeks ago. Well, those were the transients, and they are coming in and utilizing the habitat here on a regular basis now. And is that because the residents are absent? That might have something to do with it. But we have lots and lots of harbor seals and harbor porpoise in here. And the, those, seem, <laughs> those, are, those are the prey items that they're coming in to these waters for. Um, their birth rates have been 
uh, really good. They've been really successful. Um, there, I, I have one sad note about the transients to report. Some of you might recall hearing about a, a young white killer whale whose name was Kluke, which is supposedly the Bella Coola word for moon. Um, so Kluke was whitish. We're not really sure why. If it was something called leucism or maybe he had some other genetic issue that caused his skin to be kind of a whitish gray but he was about four or five years old and sadly he's missing so that that's a bummer that we're not going to get to see the little white whale um, anymore but he's not the first white whale among transients that has appeared in the in the northwest coast there have been several several of them going back hundreds of years um, even up in the coast of Alaska white killer whale is um, was a name of a of an of an elder who passed. So people have been seeing white killer whales periodically um, over the, um, the last several hundred years. So um, I the other thing I need to talk about in J Pod, especially since we're on Duwamish land, is what has happened to Princess Angeline's family. Princess Angeline was J seventeen. Um, she was the matriarch of a good-sized family. Uh, they had a really bad year in 2016. Her oldest daughter, Polaris, and uh, Polaris's youngest baby uh, son, Dipper, he wasn't even two years old, uh, J54, they, they showed up in the fall, like in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and they both showed signs of starvation. There's a condition called peanut head, where the, you see the head is shrunken in along the sides and right behind the blowhole, and that is a sign that the whales are starving. And it was it was really sad. Um, Polaris, the mother, died first, and um, Dipper's older sister and a cousin, his his seven year old older sister and the six year old cousin. Um, the sister's name is Star, J46, the cousin is Notch, J47. They tried valiantly. They were trying to feed Dipper and keep he, keep him floating at the surface. But you know, that's a little kid in whale years. Their lifespans are like ours. So those are little kid whales trying to help out their, uh, you know, this baby relative of theirs. And you know, they, Dipper ended up dying, sadly. Um, the other prominent member of, of Princess Angeline's family who made a lot of news um, was Tahlequah, J35, who, who became famous in a sad way. She carried a dead baby around with her for 17 days in the summer of 2018. And I think to First Nations people, that was, uh, that was a real sign to us. Um, one of the prominent whale researchers, Ken Balcom, referred to that as a tour of grief, but to me, also as a person of the Choctaw and other five tribes heritage who were forced forced out on a trail of tears from eastern homelands to, o to Oklahoma, uh, Tahlequah did her own trail of tears. She traveled, they, they traveled hundreds of miles around their traditional summer territory and she carried that baby, and I really think that was to get our attention, to try, you know, to to underscore what was happening with with these whales. She finally let the baby go. On a happier note, she did she did have another calf in the past year, and that baby is doing okay so far so far. But it was heartbreaking to see her carrying the dead baby around for so long. And then sadly, we lost the matriarch of the family, Princess Angeline, in um, 2019. Now I want to talk a little bit about K-Pod. As I said, Lummi K-7 was the oldest whale in K-Pod before she passed. And K-Pod's behavior was different after, after she died, too. Um, you'll notice, we noticed that the whales would pick slightly different places to visit than when these elders um, were alive, but um, one one prominent member of K-Pod that I wanted to make sure I mentioned was uh, the whale we just heard about in the news a couple weeks ago, um, K-21 Cappuccino. 
who at, at 35 was the oldest male member of the Southern Resident Community, and that's not really very old. Um, the oldest known Southern Resident male was Ruffles, J1, who passed in 2010, and he lived to be almost 60. So poor Cappuccino was only 35. And we, in the absence of a slide, we have an artistic image of him. Um, this is a limited edition print that Odin did, and we did this years ago, but we picked Cappuccino K21 as the model um, for our representational whale. He had a really beautiful, we call this an open saddle patch, he had a really beautiful open saddle pa patch and a dorsal fin that was kind of broad at the base and tapered at the top. He was very distinctive in the field, you could spot him from a long distance. Um, but he was discovered in the Strait of Juan de Fuca right around the end of July, it was like July 28th. Um, his dorsal fin was completely collapsed, like you couldn't even see it from the side, which is shocking. You never see that in a wild whale. It's, it's extremely rare. There's one northern resident who had a kind of a flopped over dorsal fin years ago, and one transient whose whale, whose fin had started falling down before he died, but to be completely collapsed over his back, it was shocking. And um, the longtime observers and the researchers all agree that it's the worst case of starvation that anyone has witnessed um, in a wild killer whale up here. Nobody can re remember seeing that. And um, so Cappuccino was barely floating um, at the surface. It was very, I watched him grow up and it was very hard for me to see him. In, in that condition. Um, but again, it underscores how they're struggling to find food. A possible complicating factor with him, I've heard a couple of the researchers speculate perhaps he had cancer. They get a number, they, they get the, some of the same diseases that we do. But um, yeah, he, they saw him one day in that condition and then he was gone. Um, it's too bad we didn't get the bot couldn't recover the body to um, do a necropsy, but that's what usually happens. It's rare that we get a body to study. <sighs> Sorry, I was working on my notes before we, before we came up here. <sighs> you know, this is a lot of sad, grim information and you know, a lot of people want to know, well, what can we do to help? And I would say besides some of the things that you probably ordinarily hear about what you can do to help, listen to indigenous elders, listen to people like Ken, listen to other indigenous elders. You know, I, I talked about when we lose um, an elder in the Southern resident community, I mentioned, you know, Granny and Lummy and Princess Angeline was, was getting up there when she died. Um, we think of, um, we think of, think of indigenous elders that we've lost in the past decade or so. People like Vi Hilbert and Bruce Miller, Subiai, Billy Frank, Bill James, Lummi. Those are just a few examples of people of uncommon wisdom and, you know, culture bearers um, that collectively the native community has lost up here and um, listen to what they're saying because they're trying to tell us about what's going on in this environment. Don't just listen to quote unquote white experts. I think that's been one of the issues is that um, predominantly white scientists have been in charge of the recovery effort and I, I'm, I don't see how we succeed at recovering the southern residents without getting the par participation of BIPOC uh, community. Uh, I, I, especially indigenous people, I, because white people have a certain world view and I think that white privilege is, is an impediment to orca recovery. I, a lot of people wouldn't say that, but as a native person, I feel that white privilege is, is, is a wall between um, a researcher and really feeling empathy for what's going on with the whale. So I think it's really important for people of color to get more involved in the 
in the recovery of, of the killer whales because I think they might, they will be doomed to extinction otherwise. Other things you hear commonly about what we can do is examine your daily lives. You know, are, are, you, are you recycling? Can you eat less meat or no meat? <laughs> Would be even more helpful. Are you eating farmed salmon? Don't eat farmed salmon. <laughs> farmed Atlantic salmon. Um, your energy use. You know, think about your individual, your ecological footprint in, in your daily life. But I, I think mostly, really importantly, lis listen to elders. Uh, you know, in in the indigenous community, who are who try who are trying to tell us about what's going on with ecosystem or wolves, the salt water, we know. And Odin has some spoken word of, about the whales that he would like to share. It's uh, actually the beginning of something I plan to do more of, which is composing Clinket songs. So it's just four lines that can be used in a song. And I, as I read it. I realized it sounds, it could be a poem, it could be song lyrics, but basically it addresses connection or a lack of connection with nature, animals. And it's no longer the knowing between us, only silence and the shame that is ours. No longer the joy of knowing, no longer the knowing of Keat. And again, Knowing refers to connection, so I'm going to continue with this uh, songwriting uh, as an artist. That's part of what, what I should be doing. And uh, Gunas Jish. Gunas Jish.